My name is Lars Ulrich Mortensen, and those four little snippets of music I played you here were all continual realizations by Johann Sebastian Bach. We usually think that Bach's exact way of playing continuo is a lost art because we are not aware that there actually is quite a lot of practical source material to this very subject. The first two snippets I played were from Bach's version of the fourth Brandenburg concerto in its guise as a harpsichord concerto where the fiddle uh, part, solo part, is uh, given to the harpsichord. And there are huge sections in that where Bach clearly writes out the continue he would have expected. Beginning, huge seven part chords in both hands. Later on in the little section where the two recorders um, uh, duet like a trio sonata where Bach's harpsichord part goes. Um, what characterizes those, this continuo style? Well, the number of voices, if we start there, is hardly ever less than four. That means that the right hand plays three part chords as a minimum, can be more. Uh, and also, whenever the bass chord changes, Bach don't just repeat the notes, so to speak, missing. But he, uh, he writes a full chord on each bass note. Already that is a huge departure from what we often hear done today. The last example I did was from the B minor sonata for flute and obbligato harpsichord, where the second movement, I'm sure you remember it, Um, marked Lago e Dolce. Bach's harpsichord part is three four part repeated chords with wonderful voice leading inside them, added dissonances but probably not a style that we would have chosen today when we see a movement called Largo e Dolce. We would often have been asked to play less notes because the harpsichord part surely is not Dolce. Well, it can be played Dolce even so. We would probably also have been asked not to play the chord so high because very often we are higher than the flute part also considered bad taste today, but it's quite surprising that the relationship between melody part and the harpsichord part is a subject of seemingly very, very little importance in contemporary uh, writings on continuum. And another example from the same sonata, we know it, it starts starting out in its usual three-part texture with one part in the flute and two moving parts in the harpsichord. But after the first 20 bars or so, um, the flute plays um, which clearly now is not an obbligato sonata anymore, but it, is a, it sounds like a solo sonata just for flute and continuo. And accordingly, 
Bach changes the harpsichord part, not just to be one voice, as it usually is in the obbligato sonata, but here he, instead he writes. And so on. That is probably not what we today would have chosen uh, as a harpsichord realization or a continual realization of that section. Again, voices up to four, but also here as a relative exception, sometimes only two part in the, in the right hand. But notice what he does with rhythm. Because we are used today uh, to play the chords with the bass, more or less. But for instance, rest, rest. And what does that do? Um, so the rhythmical setting of this uh, has a completely different and almost independent flow from the rest of the texture. The rest on the strong beat, mm, bam, 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 uh, is very typical of Bach, or in its diminution, mm, ba, 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 bam, mm, ba, 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 bam. The chord doesn't come where we expect it, it comes later, uh, and gives some quite different and much more subtle rhythmical impulses. Also, um, of course, this is, a, this is an unfigured bass part, but note, note also, for instance, and this is another typical Bach thing, that, for instance, when the flute has uh, stepwise moving intervals, Bach harmonizes them. And again, um, realizing in a way much more the harmonic possibilities in the music than what is written or not written. So it goes, as I think, as a kind of red thread through all Bach's written out continuous sections. And there are lots of those to be found in the obbligato sonatas, in the harpsichord concertos. Um, we get a quite different message from, or at least an invitation to go down a road that we don't always do, uh, that we wouldn't always do today if we just attack the music, so to speak, from scratch. The last example from Bach again, again about the subtlety and the independence on the continual part, or the creative construction, is um, the third movement of the famous sonata for violin and obbligato harpsichord in E major. I'm sure you that one, which basically is a ground bass which repeats itself. And typically Bach sets out by stating the ground bass by itself first. How would we have done that today if we have just said, okay, play something on this? we wanted to do something melodically or if we didn't just play in chords. In a thin and not too um, energetic way of interpretation. What does, Bach, what does Bach choose here? I'm sure you remember. And so on. 
again this rhythmic pattern of a rest on the downbeat and then repeated chords uh, with a beautiful voice leading with with nice harmonic interpretation he doesn't go but he treats the bass note as the passing note creating this exquisite little dissonance on the way again a way of using continual realization musically constructive to create a completely different harmonic and emotional if you will sonic world um, which to me is so much more interesting than anything that I could have dreamt up in the first place. So let's later on in this little series of podcasts go further down the road.